right, we'll go ahead and continue on our study. Appreciate Tim very much, and I appreciate the uh, the other men who serve here as elders, uh, Jimmy and Stephen. Love you guys and their wives as well for all the work that they are doing. Uh, I was thinking about how does all this tie along with the book of Isaiah, right, where we move from the kingdom leaders material into where we are right now in the book of Isaiah, but it actually fits perfectly, and um, just really want to commend the men here uh, who do serve and uh, the leadership that they are providing. Uh, that's a, a great blessing, and we are reminded in the book of Isaiah about how important leadership really is, how everything rises and falls with leadership, and if you did our did the study and the reading from our text, we're picking up, and we have to wrap up tonight, Isaiah chapters 53 through 57. If you go to chapter 56, you see the problem of the Israelites and the leaders in verse number 10, where the Bible says in Isaiah 56 and verse number 10, his watchmen are blind. All of them know nothing. All of them are mute dogs, unable to bark. Dreamers lying down who love to slumber. And the dogs are greedy. They are not satisfied and they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each one to his unjust gain, to the last one. Come, they say, let us get wine and let us drink heavily of strong drink. And tomorrow will be like today, only more so. So that was the problem with the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the leadership. Uh, and how the leaders at that time, uh, they were not considering the sheep as they should have been. They were not leading as they should have been. And so the, the kingdom leaders material is very important and uh, very much appreciate the men. Uh, who serve here. So with that, let's just quickly go back uh, this past week. Last week, we wrapped up Isaiah chapter 53, where we talked about the suffering servant. And we looked at Acts chapter 8. We know that this is talking about Jesus. So I'm going to move through some of these questions here because we have already addressed them. Chapter 54, we see this, uh, the good news really of of, uh, of Zion and uh, the great things that are going to come for the people of God. And then we wrapped up in chapter 55. And so what I like to do is look at chapter 55, 56, and 57. And Lord willing, after this, we have two more classes. So I believe we'll have two additional classes for the end of the year. So if you have any questions from the book of Isaiah, please let me know. And we'll have time to go back and do some reviewing if you like. Uh, but whether or not you give me questions, we are going to go back and review, okay? So I think that will be the most beneficial time. So I'm not just standing in front of you for 90 minutes, all right? So uh, there's a lot of information that we've looked at, 66 chapters in this book. So for next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at lesson number 16, which will go through Isaiah chapter 58 through 61. Let's look at chapter 55. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you will not run to you. And a nation which knows you not will run, will not will run to you. Because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Come upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire, and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. 
The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of thorn bush, instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up, and instead of the nettle with myrtle will come up, and it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting covenant which will not be cut off. So as I went through this chapter here, there's a couple of things that stand out to me. And this really will take us to question number seven here. And we'll get there in just a moment. I believe there's only a couple of questions here from chapter 55. Actually, there's two or three. So let's spend a few minutes talking about this. Let's see here. Yeah. To me, just reading this, I think all of us should be encouraged when we are reading the book of Isaiah, in particular, this particular block of scriptures. It can be a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe that's not the right term. Maybe just unfamiliar with, you know, how does this apply to me? What, you know, what's, you know, what, what are we going to get out of this? A lot of people, you know, look for things like that. Part of this is just getting comfortable with the, the language that the prophets used and understanding what the message they're trying to get across. And so we've looked at some of these blocks before, and we've seen the suffering servant. Uh, we've seen now even more of this good news, and some have described this as like this great invitation uh, that Isaiah is speaking about, and truly, really what it is that, that God can provide. And one of the things that really stood out to me when we get to the last chapter in chapter 57, we'll, we'll see how pointless it is uh, with, with respect to idolatry and how you can't hide anything from God. And even though the Israelites went after all these idol gods and other nations, clearly they were never satisfied. They could never accomplish what it was that they were going after. So if you have your workbook on page number 65, the author describes this as a great invitation for all to come. And he said, what a marvelous passage this is that follows on the hills of a discussion of the great blessings found in spiritual Zion. The invitation is extended to all to come and partake of the spiritual feast. And so you have this invitation at the beginning, everyone who thirsts come to the waters. And we talked a little bit about that last week, uh, about this idea of waters and blessing. And I think about John chapter four with the living water, right? And you who have no money, come by and eat. So this is something that's going to be freely given by God. Come by wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy. In other words, why are you going after the things that aren't really going to give you what you really need? And that's one big thought I think we all need to take away from this is that God is the source ultimately of our satisfaction. And if we can truly understand that, if we can truly believe that, then that will change everything. And so this chapter here with what the Messiah uh, would provide for all men is something that is very important that we need to make sure that we actually consider and and really appreciate because of who we are um, in Christ. Question number seven is kind of getting at this idea of of salvation without a price. And let me just go back here. Question number seven. Maybe I didn't put question number seven up there, but we'll talk about it anyway. Um, How would you answer the contention that says salvation is offered without a price, therefore there are no conditions to be met. So I see what the author is is trying to make sure people don't misunderstand. Uh, I think it is important to understand, you know, what it is that God can actually give us, and that is uh, salvation, uh, this grace and this pardon uh, through his son. But there is something that is important for us because sometimes there is a misunderstanding uh, about this idea of salvation is offered without a price, Therefore, there are no conditions to be met. How'd you guys go about answering that question? Go ahead, brother. Just to take that question, the Titus, right? So the third chapter of Titus, when it talks about Jesus Christ coming and being poured out upon us abundantly, yeah. um, specifically in, in verse 4, when the goodness and kindness of God our Savior is here to save us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Yeah. And that ties right in with the, the, the discussion of the on, on, on mercy and God's grace. Yeah. So the comment was made about Titus chapter 3, and I I just add to, you know, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. And certainly that ties into that. And what Stu said in chapter 3 
But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done, uh, but according to his mercy. So you definitely see this uh, connection there. What else? It also talks about uh, the fact that we've got to incline our ear to hear, and we have to come. So we have to go and partake of waters, and I'm told here uh, to forsake the evil ways. So I've got to repent. I can't just keep doing what I'm doing, and all of a sudden, you know, God's going to say, no, they have to forsake their evil ways, forsake their, their wickedness. They weren't performing works that would earn God's grace or salvation, but they did have to go receive it and go take it and, and do it. So uh, it's kind of the same parallel today. I mean, I have to obey the conditions that he set for me, and I have to repent, but uh, that's, that's not a work that's actually earning that yet. Yeah. Yeah, great thoughts here from chapter 55, and what a great chapter just to, to invite. You know, you just see so much of the gospel in the book of Isaiah where uh, you mentioned there this idea you, we do have to, to come, to come to him. In verse 3, incline your ear and come to me. Uh, God will not force us to follow him. He will not overwhelm us where we have no control, right? I think that would fall into irresistible grace where there's just nothing we can do. Well, we have to accept this invitation, this free gift that he is offering. So that's important as well. Listen that you may live. And in, in my margin here, I just have find, walk, be, where we can find him and we need to walk with him. And, and certainly what he's going to emphasize as well in the next couple of chapters as well, there is a certain way for us to walk. You know, we have to have a contrite heart and we have to be willing to turn. So there are these conditions that we're not earning our salvation, uh, but to accept this free gift um, uh, doing what, what God wants us to do. What else? Yeah, so um, going back, I think, to Deuteronomy 27 and Deuteronomy chapter 28, if I'm remembering correctly, these these blessings and curses with what God told the Israelites what would happen to them. Uh, yeah, that's a great point as well. You know, one big thought to take away from chapter 55 is really to appreciate the great God that we serve. You think about this with what we see. If you were just to take a few minutes to list some of the attributes, and this is important for young people. Uh, it's important for all of us to understand that we are saved by grace, that he is a gracious God, uh, and he does love, he loves everyone. And we're going to see that in chapter 56, Gentiles as well. In verse number 6, he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Uh, what's the best day to, to follow God and to seek after him? Today, that's exactly right. And yet, sometimes a lot of people don't do that. But today is always the best day to do that. Call upon him while he is near. Uh, he's not far. I think about Acts chapter 17. He's not far. Um, those who are willingly, who are seeking after him, uh, he will be found. Let the wicked forsake his way, as Stephen mentioned, right? So there does have to be a change. And the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him. You cannot leave this class for these next six months that we've spent looking at Isaiah, thinking that God is mean, that God is just punishing his people for no reason. That is what so many people in the world believe when they read the scriptures, and it's just a, a gross misunderstanding. Think about how patient God truly is with us uh, and just with his people as well in the in days of Israel. He is compassionate, and do not let this pass you by. He will abundantly pardon, and sometimes it's hard for us to grasp this. I think about First John chapter 1. He is faithful and righteous if we sin and we confess our sins to him, those who are in Christ, to forgive us. And this is a challenge for a lot of Christians. What, does he really forgive? Can, it, can I really be forgiven by God? Well, the answer to that is yes. And, and this is where we, we understand as we talk to people in the world and as we study with people, we, we need to help them to understand that repentance is required and that this free gift is available to everybody if they're willing to submit to what God has to say. But then we also have to understand this as well um, as we think about our walk with God. So it's just something really um, 
really thought-provoking, really good for us to consider. Any other th- uh, comments with that? All right, so there's another text here or passage in verse number three. It says, incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. Uh, where do we find that language in the New Testament? Anyone know? Any thoughts? Acts chapter 13, remember when Paul was preaching? In Acts chapter 13, I believe Barnabas was with him as well. And he was preaching about Jesus here, and that's one of the questions. What are the sure mercies of David? How would you guys answer that? Anyone? What's this connected to? All right, so let's look at Acts chapter 13 here, uh, since we just have a, a few minutes left. This is connected to, and there's a couple of passages that come to mind. In Acts 13, when, when Paul was preaching about Jesus here back in verse number 23, and as he talked about John the Baptist and the death, the burial, and the resurrection, in verse number 30, he said, But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this promise to our children and that he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to decay. He has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. And so there's that language there from Isaiah. And and so this is pointing to uh, the fact that the Christ would be raised, he would sit on, on the throne of David. And you see this language as well in the Gospel of Luke. If you turn over real quickly to Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, and this is a conversation with Gabriel the angel in verse 26 as he is speaking to Mary. In verse number 32 of Luke chapter 1, verse number 32 and 33, he said, He will be great, talking about Jesus. And will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And so that's that language that we find there in Isaiah chapter 55, certainly pointing towards the Messiah to the Christ. There's other examples of this, like in Psalm 89, verses 3 and 4. Um, and, and so it's just something important there um, of what, what this is pointing to, who this is pointing to and the great blessings that are going to come through uh, the Messiah. So in verse number 9, verse number 6 here, he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Verse number 8, For my thoughts, well, actually let's read verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth, making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the water, so my word by which goes forth from my mouth, it will be, it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire. So question number nine just ask the question in this context here in verses 9 and 10, um, how is this applied with respect to the context? Any thoughts with that real quick? This idea of my thoughts, my ways. Any thoughts? Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I think that's what he's getting at, and it really is pretty thoughtful thought provoking and it really does shine the light on uh, our struggles uh, or at least for me right where you know I can be quick to cast someone aside uh, you know what they're not they're not going to change Have you ever done that you're just kind of like all right that's it I mean you think about the Israelites here just how long he was patient with them and that he did tell them, I will abundantly pardon. If, if you just come back. Their idolatry was spiritual adultery. You read Ezekiel, like Ezekiel chapter 16, it's very graphic. 
of how God viewed what they were doing. If you read the prophet Hosea, that Schleball is going to walk us through next month. And, and you read even Isaiah here where, turn over to chapter 57. Let's just bounce around a little bit here. In chapter 57 and verse 3, he says, But come here, you sons of a sorceress, offspring of an adulterer and a prostitute. Against whom do you jest? Against whom do you open wide your mouth and stick out your tongue? Are you not children of rebellion, offspring of deceit? You know, he's just saying, who do you guys think you are? You think you can hide this? And look at what you're doing. You're an offspring of an adulterer and a prostitute who inflame yourselves among the gods. That is sexual activity there. This idea of inflame yourselves, I believe. Under every luxuriant tree who slaughter the children in the ravines. So he's just listing all of the terrible things they're doing. And yet, if they would repent, he would take them back. But for us, that is very hard to fathom. And the first person, though, we always have to think about was like, how could God take this person? You know the first person we always have to think about? Us. Me. You. When you really think about this. And so I think that's what, what Stephen mentioned. I think that's what he's driving at here. This is hard to think about. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Um, and it, it really is pretty amazing to consider. Um, and even just with what was going to take place with the Messiah. And again, his ways were not the ways of, of the nation of Israel. They had all these misconceptions or perceptions about who the Messiah was going to be. And yet he came in a, in a way that they had, they had no idea. They just missed it. Am I good? Okay, yeah. So there's something very interesting for us just to consider as we take something away from this. Maybe the mercy and grace that we have received and making sure that we don't take for granted um, what it is that we actually have been given uh, by our Savior. And this should be reason for us, brothers and sisters, to s continue to seek change. And continue to leave sin behind. When you think about how much God has blessed us and pardoned us, forgiven us, that's chapter 53. So we see the price and we see this great love. So we have about three minutes left. So I want to get to uh, chapter 56 and 57 and, and we'll wrap this up. There's a lot more that we could say. Maybe we'll come back to this at the end. Uh, there are some different questions or different thoughts in chapter 56 with the first uh, eight verses, just doing some reading on this. Um, one thing that stood out to me in chapter 56 is, again, you know, this salvation and how it's, uh, how it's available for, uh, for everyone. And in the book here on page number 66, it says, uh, Here the prophet urges faithfulness of those who seek to follow the Lord. He speaks of faithfulness in the day of the Messiah, and he comes back to his own time and contrasts the worthless leaders to the better days of the Messiah. And we already touched on that. And in this commentary and other commentaries as well, it looks like he took this from another one. Whether speaking of those who return from Babylon or those who are in the church today, faithfulness is required to be blessed. And that's something that we definitely have seen uh, in the book of Isaiah. One thing that really caught my attention here, you know, you, th you go back to chapter 54, where there's a shouting and the borders are going to be uh, enlarged. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch out the curtains of your dwelling, spare not, lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs, which was pointing to um, uh, the future, obviously, with the, with the church. You see now, again, I think Gentiles uh, in verse three of chapter 56, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuchs say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths. And Sabbath was a way of showing one sincerity with the law, this idea of keeping the Sabbath. And choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. To them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. So all are, all are welcome. Uh, all can follow God. Uh, you think about the, the eunuchs and 
and just the law in general. You read about the eunuchs like in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and Numbers chapter 15 and 1 Kings chapter 8. And obviously we don't have time for that. But he says in verse 6, Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. Even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. All are welcome. This invitation is for all, Jew and Gentile, for those who are willing to uh, obey God and to submit to his will. So we'll pick up and we'll wrap this up. There's a couple more thoughts. The one thing I would ask you to consider is the great invitation, the great blessings that all of us have in Christ and the impact that that should have on our lives. So we'll pick up, uh, be ready for next week, the next lesson, chapters 58 through 61. Let's say a quick prayer, and then we'll be dismissed from the back. Father in heaven, you are, you are awesome. And we are thankful for your great love. We're thankful, Father, for your uh, great mercy and grace. Thank you, Father, for this congregation here, for the leaders that we have here at this congregation. Help us, Father, to take the time tonight and the rest of the week to really count our blessings, to appreciate who we are because of you and because of the grace that appeared through your Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.